It is possible I already had some presentiment of my future, the locked and rusted gate that stood before us, with wisps of river fog threading its spikes like the mountain paths, remains in my mind now as the symbol of my exile. That is why I have begun this account of it with the aftermath of our swim, in which I, the torturer's apprentice Severian, had so nearly drowned. Thus begins Gene Wolfe's masterpiece, The Book of the New Sun. Hi. I'm Mark Armini, and today we're going to talk about Gene Wolfe's masterpiece, The Book of the New Sun. Most readers will probably have been introduced to Wolfe through this particular series, which began with The Shadow of the Torturer, um, first published in the early 80s. Uh, my own first reading experience with Wolfe began in probably the late, the late 1980s when um, someone happened to give my father a copy of Claw the Conciliator and I needed to find the first volume and I read it. I was still probably in the fourth or fifth grade. So I do understand the inscrutable nature of the text, especially to a reader who's not used to those subtle nuances that Wolf employs, those stylistic things that come up in his work several times. So one of the things that I wanted to start with was looking at the existing criticism, the published work on Wolf, before we talk about the particulars of the Book of the New Sun. Um, probably the most neutral reference in terms of its usefulness and its general objectivity is The Lex Conarthus by Michael Andradriasi. And this particular volume is very useful, especially, you know, before the internet was around when you could look up these words and their origin. He put a lot of research into finding all these terms because one of the things that the series is famous for is its use of all these, you know, Greek and Roman root words that are valid but are very obscure and that kind of complicates understanding the text as well. Um, another full-length reference work that, um, that we have is Robert Borsky's Solar Labyrinth. Now, most of Gorsky's work is concerned with solving mysteries that he believes are in the text. So when you're reading Gorsky, you have to realize that this is reader response criticism at its finest, right? He's taking mysteries and he's trying to solve them, most of them involving familiar relationships and patterns that he perceives. One of the things that he does well is identifying the the ape association with Father Inire throughout the text and his role behind the scenes. One of the things that he tends to go too far on is random associations and creating whole scenes that are not there. So, you know, anytime you approach this, you have to take, um, reading the text, the primary text, should be your first initial instinct. Attending Daedalus takes a naturalistic approach to the Book of the New Sun. My issue with this is that it kind of negates the idea that Severian, the main character, has free will. This is very important to Wolf as a Catholic writer, and I think that Wright's thesis, while useful, tends to overstate those traditional aspects of early 20th century British and American fiction, and doesn't see Wolf in the history of mystery writers and allegorists who treat religion as a very serious topic. It's not some game of manipulation. However, what sets the Book of the New Sun apart from other works of, I'm going to use the term, religious propaganda, and New Sun is not really that. But what I mean is, it has a religious agenda in the background that is extremely complicated by the mechanics of the way everything works. So we have a situation where hey, maybe this guy is a Christ-like figure. Maybe he's Christ at the Parousia. All these ideas of the eschaton and the end of time and the redemption of humanity are very religious in nature. And Wright's view that the Herodules and the Hierogametes are manipulating Severian beyond his ability to choose actually negates a fair portion of the impact of the text. So we're going to take a look at some of the specific scenes of the Book of the New Sun, which is... In summary, the story of a torturer who's cast out of his guild in the far future because he has mercy on a client. And by mercy, we mean he gives her an avenue to kill herself before her actual execution method would do so, before the revolutionary can lead her to actually 
um, kill herself more painfully in a more prolonged, tortuous fashion. So his mercy is a little bit strange. It's extinction in the final analysis. And as he's cast out in an attempt to redeem himself to his guild, he comes across a religious icon. The majority of the text, the four volumes, is him trying to return the Claw of the Conciliator, which unknowingly fell into his hands. So, part of the reaction to Gene Wolfe's Book of the New Sun is saying that, hey, there really isn't much of a plot beyond that. What's going on? And the subtlety, the nuance, the, the accumulation of symbols is what creates this initial disorientation and confusion in the text. So there's a few very particular details that I wanted to look at that create a much better idea of what's going on and even negate, in some fashion, the need to read Earth of the New Sun for closure. Um, if you look at some of the patterns that Wolf is repeating, you see that he had that ending pretty well planned out from the very beginning. So in the opening section of the Book of the New Sun, there's a little quote at the beginning from Isaac Watson that reads, A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone, should as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. And many of the themes of the book are actually ensconced in this brief quotation, especially if you look at the entire um, psalm. So, what we're going to do is take a brief look at, at that psalm in its entirety, and then talk about how this relates to the rest of the text. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne still may we dwell secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defense is sure. Before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame, from everlasting thou art God, to endless years the same. Thy word commands our flesh to dust, return ye sons of men. All nations rose from earth at first, and turned to earth again. A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone, short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. The busy tribes of flesh and blood, with all their lives and cares, are carried downwards by the flood, and lost in following years. Time, like an ever-rolling stream, bears all its sons away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. Like flowery fields the nations stand, pleased with the morning light. The flowers beneath the mower's hand lie withering ere tis night. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou our guard while life shall last and our eternal home. So if you look at this text, you already see the idea that all of mankind is going to be decimated, carried downwards by the flood, right? This great decimation of a flood. If you've read The Earth of the New Sun, you're, you know exactly what's going to happen. And this is also repeated in that embedded play in Claw of the Conciliator, Volume 2, called Eschatology and Genesis, in which the beginning and the ending are kind of equated, where you have this story that seems to recapitulate that of Adam and Eve, right? A new Adam and a new Eve arrive on Earth, and then the flood comes and kind of wipes out everything for a fresh beginning. This is in the Claw of the Conciliator. This is also written into this psalm as well, and it also evinces several other themes that are prevalent in the Book of the New Sun. One of them is that the old ages of man are going to be swept away, right? Like flowery fields, the nations stand pleased with the morning light. The new sun, this light, is going to bring flowery fields. And we see this in the green man, who's supposedly going to be the future of man, where there's some combination of these photosynthetic chemicals inside his blood and humanity, so that it survives in this era, where the new sun is actually going to be its sustenance, its food that's going to preserve mankind. And if you look at many of the images in the text, they're heliocentric in nature. So the earth will rise up to meet the face of the sun. This is repeated over and over, and this is important to Severian's narrative, right? Because his ironic distance from all these statements, like when he's with Sarayka at the ball at the start of Claw the Conciliator, he says, hey, imagine if the Conciliator were here, unknown, and he would be watching all these people pretending to be someone they're not, and I alone, like light, would be unchanged, right, timeless. So there's this idea of timelessness, the negation of time, the coming of a new sun. When the narrative begins, 
initially, the first chapter and the second chapter in Wolf's original plan were to be switched, right? That second chapter was supposed to be the first one. And in it, Severian talks of two visions that were coming, almost like a dream. And in one of them, he dreams of a miraculous light coming uh, that will rekindle this dying sun. And in the other one, he speaks of a brush will grow eyes and scurry up a tree, right? So this idea that vegetation is going to come alive is there from that very second chapter, which was originally intended to the first. Also, that first chapter is titled Resurrection and Death, which is an inversion of the normal order of things. So when you're looking at the Book of the New Sun, you see um, usually there's death and resurrection. Here, the two are equated. Severian drowns and awakens to new life, just as Earth is going to do the same thing. And this motif is repeated over and over. For example, when Dorcas originally shows up, and we've already talked about the resonance of her name with the story of Tabitha Dorcas, who's resurrected in the Acts of the Apostles, right? If you're familiar with that story, you already know when he's crossing over that giant watery grave that what he's pulling up nude from that is life that has long since passed. When Severian uh, grabs her and touches her somehow, and, and this engenders that life that returns, you see later this fear she has. This terrible fear of water. She's like, I'm so scared of water. Because she's been submerged in it so long. But this also presages the fate of Earth, where this watery doom is going to come. When he is fighting the apes in the mine at Saltis, you see him trip in the water, right? And he cuts off one of the apes' arms and he's killing them. And then he starts healing them, right? He closes the sutures on the arm. He's able to actually, when he pulls the claw of the conciliator out, reverse that destruction. So we have this idea of water paired with destruction throughout the text that's repeated many, many times. Even when we finally get that scene with Typhon as Satan in there, where Severian encounters the Satan figure of new son Typhon. And this symbolic resonance is complicated in long son and short son by a great deal. So we'll talk about this some more later. But we have this, this confrontation the temptation in the desert, basically. Severian is parched. He has no water. And he really, really needs to drink or he feels as if he's going to die. And young Severian, right, young Severian there, has touched the ring uh, on the, the statue of the hand and has pretty much died. And Severian wonders if that brought Typhon to life or if something else did. And Typhon says some very strange things. He says, ah, yes, water, new life. Right? Even the Satan figure seems to understand that the deluge is what's actually going to bring about this resurrection of Earth. Now, what makes New Sun more complicated than many of the other religious parallels that we have, like uh, Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress, Pilgrim's Progress, or Dante's Divine Comedy, is that it's not even clear that Severian's a truly heroic figure, even to the very end where he's done all these things to cast off the trappings of his old surroundings. You still have him hesitating to save people, still uh, bullying Pia and her people at the, at the lake there after he comes down from the mountain and sees Typhon in Sword of the Lictor. So all of these things work to complicate the hints Severian keeps dropping that he may in fact be the conciliator and the relationship between that and actually Christic imagery, right? For example, in The Claw of the Conciliator, he's sitting there and he's like, oh wow, there's wine in our water jugs. How exactly did this come about? You know, the indication of turning water into wine and of resurrecting people um, and of being tempted by Typhon there, right? That scene plays out like the temptation in the desert, almost line by line. He offers him food. He offers him water. He offers him dominion if he bows to him. So all these scenes that parallel their biblical scenes say, hey, wow, this particular torture at the end of time seems more like Christ than we are comfortable even saying, because he clearly has some character flaws, um, like his, you know, his sexuality and several other things that seem almost violent in nature that are very far from what we like to think of Christ as an ideal. So we have this complicated scheme, and in addition, right, he is originally cast out for killing or allowing Thecla to kill herself. So we have this situation where his ideal woman at the beginning is just an, ache, an echo of Vodalus and his woman Thea. Thecla looks like Thea, so he's attracted to her, and then eventually that becomes his ideal. So we see how these ideals constantly change, and the way that these 
Hero Jules and these Hero Gametes are manipulating him to some degree. That is certainly true, right? They're there all the time. There's always some presence there in the form usually of these Eidolons and Master Malrubius, who's been long dead, guiding his hand to some degree. So another thing that I wanted to talk about, though, are the elided scenes that create so much problems in interpretation. So at the end of The Shadow of the Torture, we have the scene at the Piteous Gate. What is the gate? Right. This is where he meets Jonas, right, the artificial man, um, who has kind of taken biological parts to repair himself and hopes to become fully functional as a robot, even though this is an inversion, just as we have Baldanders and Dr. Talos, right, that, that giant man where it seems as if Dr. Talos is the master at first, but eventually that inverts and Baldanders is, so we have that inversion of the Doctor and the Frankenstein monster where the monster is actually the master. So, we have here this situation at the gate where there's this big disturbance and everybody's separated and then we have this big gap between the start of the second novel. Well, what actually is the gate for? It's the defense of the autark, right? And Severian is very tight-lipped about these defenses of the autark throughout the entire thing. Later on, when he goes into the mine at Saltus, he talks about how, ah, oh, yes, I know the words now that will use these as the defenses of the autark. So those apes and that thing that awakens down there seems to be somehow related, and he's very hesitant to describe it. At the end of Citadel of the Autark, the Autark actually shows up on this giant elephantine steed that kind of makes him think of those quakes underground. And we also have him seeing this walking mechanical tower there that's fighting in that final battle scene. So you get the sense that the Autark has defenses, right, like that giant wall, that he has an ability to defend himself from Abai and those other sea powers, and that Severian, who is going to back into the throne, is reluctant once he's at that point to actually share those moments of secular authority and for fear of giving them away to his enemies. Because what he is establishing here is, as John Clute once said, um, the basis for obedience, right? We obey. That's the secret for everything in these novels. He obeys the Torturer's Guild until he doesn't, and then he has to find a new order, and he insinuates that when Malrubius shows up, he teaches him the highest form of government, which is not some abstract form of communism or even an elected official, but some form of divine ruler where there is no actual secession. So this highest form of government, according to Severian, echoes the idea of, you know, a religious cosmos where you have no secession and rules that are absolute in nature. And one of the things that's most fascinating about the Book of the New Sun is the idea that so many people come to it as a testament to subjectivity, where everyone reads something different. But in The Claw of the Conciliator, when he catches up with Vodalus, his hero, Thea actually says, imagine a linguistic system, a language, where there's more than one meaning. That's crazy, right? Because they have a perspicuous future, like the original intention of Ben Johnson's um, dictionary, where he wanted to have this one word, one definition correlation, so that when you read the scripture, ideally, right, with this Protestant Reformation in mind, that you would be able to see the truth, the truth, right, with a capital T. Well, in the future of Severian, it seems as if language has aspired to this goal. However, everything that Severian says actually has multiple meanings, right? When he comes across Triskel and it says he was the smallest of those dead, that description there, if we take it literally, implies that Severian has those healing powers of the claw well before he ever actually attained it. So we have this confusion of cause and effect throughout the entire narrative, and this multiplication of meanings. However, it seems as if there is still this absolute imperative that's operating behind the scenes. I wanted to take a look at very quickly was the denouement of the original four tales, where he comes back and he has ascended to the throne, and he goes and says, hey, I am going to take the test, right? I'm going to risk emasculation. What is emasculation? It's cutting off the future. There will be no descendants. If he fails, there will be no descendants for it. So this symbolic importance there is, is repeated. 
And also, this parallel of the eschaton in Genesis, the end of time and the beginning, is something that's pretty sublime. Now, one of the things that I did want to talk about in terms of criticism that I think is useful in doing this is Harold Bloom's idea of misprision, where people will creatively misread a huge impact of the past. And with Wolf, that was clearly Jack Vance's dying earth. In addition to Vance, Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past was a huge influence on Gene Wolfe. He took many of the scenes from Remembrance of Things Past, uh, such as uh, when Marcel receives the letter um, after the death of Albertine, right? That same scene is replayed with the death of Thecla, where he receives that letter forged by Aegea and believes for an instant that she's still alive. He also takes some of the same lines like, all men love that which they destroy, and time turns our lies into truth, and uh, that being who we are remains our unforgivable sin, almost wholesale from some of the volumes of Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. Even the way that involuntary memory is returned in um, Remembrance of Things Past, in which Marcel eats a Madeleine one night, also is recapitulated in the way that Severian eats a Chatelaine instead to get her involuntary memories. So that's just a huge influence on Wolf in the Book of the New Sun as well. Other literary influences include Kafka, Borges, and of course the most important one I already mentioned, the SF influence of Jack Vance. However, where Vance tends to take that picaresque view and turn away from mysticism and religion to science. The science fantasy here kind of reinforces the mysticism, right? We have all these ghosts of those long dead, and even though there's a technological explanation, there's also something mysterious about them. So when Severian is leaving Nisus at the end of Shadow of the Torture, he sees this mysterious castle in the sky. And we know, hey, that's an easy explanation by the end. Fire made the tent of the Pillarines rise up into the sky, so there was a physical, tangible explanation. But it also stood for something else. This was the step toward that higher casting off of his evil beginnings. Not necessarily evil, but fallen and corrupt, right? Where his job is to torture and destroy. But the irony of this is that the savior figure is ultimately going to destroy everything and create new life. And is the green man worth it? Is it worth it destroying everyone for this salvation that was totally not as he originally envisioned? So we have these images of the flood, images of the end and the beginning married together. And even, you know, those embedded stories in um, Citadel of the Autarch and that play in Claw the Conciliator, where you have those stories, you clearly have parallels with the real situation that Severian's going through. So when Jahi the demon in there says, in real life I'm bigger than all of you, it's clear that she's supposed to resonate with Juturna, that giant undine. So even though there's multiple, you know, explications that are possible, there's still this correlation that we can make that tends to make sense of everything. There are several repeated patterns that really make sense of the themes and symbols that Wolf is using throughout. Um, the heliocentric imagery where the sun is the center of everything, right? Also, the hydromancy that's implicit in the Vatic Fountain, where the traces of water shows you the destiny that's going to happen. This augury that's recapitulated over and over in the watery grave and resurrection of Dorcas, in Severian's own drowning, in the fate of Earth itself. So this hydromancy lets us actually tell the future, where the eschaton and Genesis, the origin, are combined as Dr. Talos' play presages. So these these embedded tales that occur are really central to the understanding of the Book of the New Sun, just as they were in Peace and the Fifth Head of Cerberus. Next time we're actually going to continue with a few more specific details as it ties in with Earth, Earth of the New Sun and the books of the Long Sun and Short Sun, because this is a very complicated endeavor here. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to leave us with this time, though, is that it is a mistake to not view the narrative as a religious narrative, right? All these resonances with saints' names. For example, the original story of Bluebeard involved a saint named um, St. Gildas who reattached his, his wife's head after she was beheaded. And the Master of the Apprentices in the scene 
where the Feast of St. Catherine takes place, where she's kind of tortured on the, on the wheel and then beheaded, involves the Master of Apprentices being named Gildas. So Wolf is familiar with all the stories of the saints and the resonance with the text. So we do have a religious document where all these people who are named after saints, that means something. All those extra earthen um, deities, all those extraterrestrial beings that are named after deities or figures from fiction, that also shows something about them. However, in the backdrop, there is the story of Typhon's redemption, and this is one of the strangest things in the entire work. So we'll talk about that more next time. Let's close with one of the most powerful passages found in the Book of the New Sun. What struck me on the beach, and it struck me indeed, so that I staggered as at a blow, was that if the eternal principle had rested in that curved thorn I'd carried about my neck across so many leagues, and if it now rested in the new thorn, perhaps the same thorn I had only now put there, then it might rest in everything, in every thorn, in every bush, in every drop of water in the sea. The thorn was a sacred claw because all thorns were sacred claws. The sand in my boots was sacred sand because it came from a beach of sacred sand. The Cenobites treasured up the relics of the Sanyasins because the Sanyasins had approached the Pan Creator. But everything had approached and even touched the Pan Creator because everything had dropped from his hand. Everything was a relic. All the world was a relic. I drew off my boots that had traveled with me so far and threw them into the waves, that I might not walk shod on holy ground.